Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you this evening for uh, the privilege that we have to be able to meet together, to look together into your word. I pray now that your Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and direction. I pray that you would teach us some things this evening that would be a blessing, that would be beneficial to us uh, in our own walk with you. May your will be done in each of our hearts and lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Leviticus in chapter 14. Uh, the book of Leviticus chapter 14. Some, some have debated the question, uh, and the question is simply this. When you are faced with good news or bad news, which one do you want to hear first? Um, you want to hear the, the bad news first? You want to hear the good news first? Well, uh, according to one study I read about, yeah, they actually did a study of this. And, and according to one study I read about, experiments showed that the great majority of people, in fact, it, it was more than 75%, said that they always want to hear the bad news first. Now, the reason for this is simply because if they, if they get the good news first, uh, then the bad news is going to dampen or it's going to diminish the joy of the good news. But on the other hand, if they get the bad news first, then the good news will make the bad news seem not so bad. You, you understand what I'm saying? But, but, but that's, the, that's the idea. For example, you go to the doctor for a physical exam, and the doctor says, I, I have some bad news. Uh, you have cancer. Well, that word alone will strike fear into your heart. But then suppose the doctor immediately follows that bad news and says to you, the bad news is you have cancer, but the good news is, the good news is we have a treatment that is highly effective in, in, in curing this kind of cancer. And, and, and when you get that good news after the bad news, then the dark clouds of fear and, and, and dread are brightened with a ray of hope. Now, certainly the same was true for a man or a woman uh, in the nation of Israel when they went to the priest with some festering sore in their flesh. Uh, they, would, they would nervously wait as the priest examined uh, the sight of their concern. And, and, and certainly their heart would be filled with, with fear when they heard the priest say, I'm sorry, but you have leprosy. The reason why they would be fearful was simply because of the fact that that statement was basically a death sentence. You, you see, there was no cure for leprosy in those days. Now, now you remember Miriam uh, in Numbers chapter 12, she was the sister of Moses. And, and you remember she was struck with leprosy because of her pride and her self-promotion. And for seven days, she was, she was an outcast. Outside the camp of Israel was not allowed to come in among God's people. But then the Lord God had graciously healed her. Uh, that was an amazing thing. And, and then you remember Naaman the Syrian in 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, Naaman the Syrian was cured after he obeyed the prophet Elisha and, and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River as the Lord God had commanded. But there's an interesting commentary that the Lord Jesus gives on this, and it's found in Luke chapter 4, verse number 27. The Bible says that there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisuus the prophet, or Elisha the prophet. And notice what he says. None of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Bottom line is, except for those two cases, Miriam and Naaman, except for those two cases, no Jew living in Israel had ever met or had ever heard about somebody being cured of leprosy until the Lord Jesus came, until the Lord Jesus came. And that is why in our text, we find that there is actually a process of purification that was given. A process of purification was given for those lepers who would be healed of their leprosy by the grace of God. 
And that's what we're going to be dealing with in our study together this evening. Now, you remember last time in our study together, we saw how that, how that leprosy is one of the clearest pictures. It's one of the clearest pictures of sin in all of the Bible. There were four things that we learned about the sinfulness of sin as we considered the story of the leper. First of all, we talked about the depth of sin, how that it is, it's deeper than the skin, just like leprosy. It's deeper than the skin. In fact, sin is so deep that the Bible says it's a heart problem. We talked about the spread of sin, how that it spreads internally, and then it spreads through our genes to our children, uh, so that the Bible says that, that all have sinned. We talked about the defiling of sin, how that everything that it, we touch is defiled by the fact that we are sinners. That's why the Bible says that, that there's no good thing that we can do to earn or to merit God's favor. It's because everything we touch is polluted by our sin. And then we, we see the judging of sin. There's an isolation there. And, and by the way, it's still true today. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah 59 two. notice that your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Just as the Jew in those days was, was separated from the rest of the camp they were put outside the camp. They were literally, they were literally isolated in a wilderness place. In the very same way, our sin has come between us and God. Come between us and God. But the wonderful truth is, is that the fact of our sinfulness is not the only message in the Bible. Aren't you glad about that? If the fact of our sin was the only message in the Bible, the Bible would be a very depressing book to read. Truth of the matter is the Bible has some good news. And, and that good news is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice it in Luke 24, verse 46 to verse number 47. It says, thus it is written, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. In other words, just as Miriam and Naaman were cleansed of their leprosy by God's grace, it's by that same amazing grace that today there is a cure for sin that is available for every sinner on the face of this earth. So let's notice the process of purification that it was given to the nation of Israel and four points that we want us to consider together. First of all, notice the examination. In verse one and uh, down to verse number three here in Leviticus chapter 14, the Bible says, and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest and the priest shall go forth out of the camp and the priest shall look and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. Now remember, the leper is an outcast. He, he, he's outside of the camp. He's out in a wilderness area. He, he's out there all alone, lest he should cause others to become infected with his leprosy. But, but now one day as he's out there in the, in the wilderness area, he, he notices that, you know, that place, that place on my skin, it's, it doesn't look like it did before. It, 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 it looks like it's actually getting better. And, and then a couple of days later, he looks and, and the sore is totally gone. His skin is, is now clear. And so therefore he would call to a traveler passing by. Remember anybody passing by, the leper was required to cover his mouth and to cry out unclean, unclean. But, but, but now he cries out to a traveler is passing by. And, and basically he will ask the traveler to do two things. First of all, he will ask that traveler to go into the city and to inform the priest of a change that has been observed in his skin. And then he will also request that that priest might come and make a new examination. And so the priest then would leave the city. He would go out into the wilderness to meet the leper. And, and there he would examine that leper to see if the leprosy was really gone or not. 
But you know what? The grace of God is even greater for us. The grace of God is even greater because you see, God did not wait for us to be healed from our sinful condition before he sent our great high priest. The Bible says God showed his love for all mankind, 1 John 4, 9, by sending his only begotten son into the world of wicked and sinful men. He didn't wait until we got better to send his son. He sent his son while we were still lost and undone. And then God also showed his love for wicked and sinful men in Romans chapter five, verse eight, by allowing his son to take our sin, to take our wickedness upon himself and die in our place, just as that Old Testament prophet foretold back in Isaiah chapter 53, verse five and verse number six. But here's the point. Before anyone could be pronounced clean, not only did there have to be an examination, there also had to be, number two, the sacrifice. In verse four and verse number five, the Bible says, then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed, two birds alive and clean and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. Now these two birds that were sacrificed give us actually a very beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's notice these two birds together. First of all, notice the bird that was offered. The bird that was offered. This one bird that was chosen was placed in an earthen vessel and there he was killed. His blood was drained out into this earthen vessel. And in the very same way, the Lord Jesus clothed his Himself. He clothed himself in a, in, a, in a body of earth. He clothed himself in a, in a body of human flesh. And, and then he died by shedding his blood there on the cross of Calvary. But the fact of the matter is, just as you see illustrated in the Passover feast, the shedding of blood would be of no benefit. The shedding of blood would be of no value until that blood was applied. The blood at the Passover, after it was shed, it had to be applied to the doorpost in order for salvation to come to that house. And for us today, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who died for us, the fact that he died for us does not save us until that blood is applied by faith to our heart. And the same thing was true here for the leper. The blood had to be shed, but it was of no value until the blood was applied. And that brings us then to the bird released. In Leviticus chapter 14, verse 6 and verse number 7, as for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over running water and he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. In other words, this bird is, he's actually dipped into the shed blood of the first blood. That blood is then sprinkled. It's applied to the leper. And, and then that bird was released. And what a beautiful picture that is. Because by the releasing of that bird, it symbolized the fact that this man's leprosy has truly been taken away. It's truly been gone. No leper could be pronounced clean until the blood was applied. And again, that's the very same thing that is true today. When Jesus Christ died, he took his own blood up into heaven, Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 12, to make an atonement for the sins of the world. By the sacrifice of himself, the Lord Jesus has put away sin, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. And therefore, it is only when the blood is applied to our hearts by faith that we then know the reality of the wonderful statement in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, that it is the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that cleanseth us from all sin. There is no other way of cleansing. Robert Lowry, the hymn writer, was absolutely right when he penned the words, 
Remember, he asked the question, what can wash away my sin? And then he gave the answer, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There was the examination. There was the sacrifice. And then then notice number three, there was the evidence. After the priest declared the leprosy was gone, the unclean man is now clean. After the priest has made the declaration, the man is now clean. But, But that was not enough because you see a man who is cleansed of his leprosy, He does not want to continue to live outside the camp. He he wants to be with his family. He wants to be with his friends, with his neighbors. He he wants to be brought back into the society from which he had been excommunicated. But, But not only that, a man who is cleansed of his leprosy, he did not want to continue to wear the garments of a leper. And so there was a process given that would bring him home. After he has been pronounced clean, the leprosy is gone, the priest is examined it, the offerings have been offered, the blood has been applied, the declaration has been made, this man is now cleansed of his leprosy. Now there's a process that would bring him home. The Bible says in verse number eight, he that is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, wash himself in water that he may be clean. And after that, he shall come into the camp and shall tarry abroad out of his tent seven days. Now notice this, he, 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 he shaves off his hair, he washes his clothes, washes his body. He, he's clean, he, he's able to come into the camp and yet still he is not able to go home for seven days. But then notice verse number nine, it says, but it shall be on the seventh day. In other words, after one week, I guess today we would call this a, a, a stay away from home notice, okay? But, but after seven days, after one week, he's going to shave all the hair again off of his head. He shaved it once, but over that week, it started to grow back. Now he shaves it again. So he shaves all the hair off his head and, and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair, he shall shave off. He'll wash his clothes Also, he shall wash his flesh in water, and he shall be clean. Now, now here's here's the picture we find here. This man who has been pronounced clean before, now he is living like one who is clean. Are you getting the picture? He's been pronounced clean, but, but now he's actually beginning to live like one who is clean. And by the way, that's God's desire. That's God's desire for every sinner who has been washed and made clean by the precious blood of Christ. It's a wonderful thing to be saved. And, 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 and God is glorified when men put their faith and trust in him. But you know, there's more to it than just saving our soul. God wants us to live differently. He wants us to live like we're now a new child, a new creation. He wants us to live as the apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 1.15. He wants us to live like holy people. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of your conversation, in all of our lifestyle. We are to exhibit the truth. We're to demonstrate to others the fact that our lives have been changed. We're different now. We're different now. There was the examination. There was a sacrifice. There, there was the evidence that was seen. Now there's a, the, this, this person is now living like one who is clean. And then, and then number four, there was the presentation, the presentation. In verse 10 and verse number 11, the Bible says, and on the eighth day, that is eight, uh, by the way, just interesting to mention this, uh, eight is the number of new beginnings. If you study numerology in the scriptures, uh, the number eight, it's the number of new beginnings. And on that eighth day, the Bible says he shall take two he lambs without blemish and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish. 
and three tenth deals of fine flour for a meat offering mingled with oil and one log of oil. And the priest that maketh him clean shall present the man that is to be made clean and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. I notice there's, there's four steps in this presentation. First of all, there's the presentation, you will notice, there's the presentation of a trespass offering. In verse 12 to verse 18, uh, the apostle Paul said, or chapter 12, verse one of the book of Romans, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. And that's exactly what we find in Leviticus chapter four, verse 14. Listen to what it says. It says, and the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and the priest shall put it. He shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed and upon the thumb of his right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot. This is the same thing that we saw before, if you'll remember. It's the same thing we saw before concerning the consecration of the priest. You remember when the priests were consecrated, when they were, when they were, when they were brought before Moses and they're getting ready to begin their ministry in the tabernacle. You remember blood was applied to the right ear. And, and we saw how that, that simply symbolized that they're ready to hear God's word. And then blood was applied to the thumb of the right hand. And, and we noted how that symbolized the fact that now they're ready to do God's work. And then we saw how that the blood was applied to the great toe of their right foot. And, and again, symbolizing the fact that they're ready to walk in God's way. And so the presentation, the blood was applied. But not only that, there was also oil applied. We find that in chapter 14, verse 15 to verse 18. And as you know, throughout the scripture, oil is a, it's a type, it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so this oil would be sprinkled before the Lord God seven times. And, and then it would be used to anoint, again, the right ear, the thumb of the right hand, the great toe of the right foot, and also the head of the leper who was to be made clean. I think this, this covering of every part of the body, starting with the, starting with the ear, and the hands and the feet and the, and the head. It, it symbolizes the fact of the admonition that is given in Ephesians chapter five, verse 18, uh, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. In other words, just as a drunkard is totally controlled by the wine that he drinks, he's totally controlled so that he begins to do things that normally when he was sober, he would never do that. I, I often read this and I, I think about a fellow I was in the army with. He was a, he was a, just a little scrawny guy. Just, just, he, he, he wasn't, he, even I was big compared to him, but, but he would go out every payday. He would get drunk. He would come back to the barracks and he would want to pick a fight with the biggest guy in our whole company. And every time he would do that. Every time, why did he do? Because he was controlled, controlled by the drink that he had consumed. Totally controlled in every way. They do things normally they wouldn't do. They say things normally they wouldn't say. They act in a way normally they wouldn't act that way. But why do they do it? Because they're under the control of the alcohol. And that's the very same way that we ought to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. That's exactly the parallel that Paul is making for us here. Uh, we're to be totally controlled by God's Holy Spirit. Bottom line, this former leper, when you compare the scriptures together, uh, this former leper is now actually being treated like a priest. He's being treated like a priest. And the very same thing is true for us who've been saved. The Bible says in 1 Peter, in the book of 1 Peter and chapter, chapter 2 and verse number 5, that as believers, we are built up a spiritual house. We are a holy 
priesthood. And what is our job? Our job is to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And so there is the presentation. There's the presentation of the trespass offering. There's also the presentation of the sin offering in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 19. There's the presentation of the burnt offering, Leviticus chapter 14, verse 20. In other words, the consecration of him, of his whole self. And then there's the offering of the meat offering, Leviticus 14, verse 20, which is the consecration, you remember, of his stuff. And again, in Leviticus 14, verse 21 to verse 32, we find that the Lord God makes a very gracious provision for the poor. He makes a gracious provision. There's a special provision for those who are unable to bring the lambs that were required. God makes a special provision for them. Now, as we bring this to a close, it's interesting to notice how this chapter ends. Verse 33 to verse number 47. The chapter actually ends with instructions for cleansing a house. Have you ever seen anything like that growing in, in, in Singapore? Uh, probably, probably you may have. But, but uh, this, this, this mold, this, this would be a type of, of the leprosy that would be found in a house. And, 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 and in this passage, it talks about the, the demo and the renovation. My wife loves to watch these shows on, on TV where they go in and they take an old house and, and they do their demo, they tear everything apart, and, and then they put it all back together. And, and, and boy, it's, it's, it's a, a, a beautiful thing. But, but when a person found an unclean plague in their house, there would have to be demolition. And then they would come in and they would renovate. But after the renovation was done, if the plague was still found, or if the plague came back, then the Bible says that the whole house had to be torn down and dumped in an unclean place. You say, Pastor, how does that fit in the context of the personal cleansing of a leper? How does this thing about cleansing a house, how does that fit in the personal cleansing of a, of a man or a woman who who has been delivered from the disease of leprosy. Well, I believe the point being made is simply this. When a man is truly clean before God, there will be a visible difference in his public life and in his home life. There, there's going to be a visible difference in his public life and in his home life. In other words, bottom line, if a man acts like a saint at church, but lives like a devil at home, there's something wrong. There is something that is wrong there. That's a man who is not truly right with God. And so as we consider this, and as we bring it to a close, my question would be this, what, 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 is, your, what is your life? Not, not just in public when you come to church, what, what is your life like at home with your, with your wife, your husband, your, your kids, your parents? Uh, what is your life in public and in private, saying about your relationship with God. May, may God help us to be truly clean, to be truly clean at all times and in every place in order that we might be the testimony for our Savior that we ought to be. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for your word and for these things that we have been able to learn together. Lord, I pray that you would take these few thoughts and that you would apply them in each heart and in each life. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would help each one of us to, to truly be clean. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to be exactly what you would have for us to be, uh, not only in public, but when we're in the privacy of our own home. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, amen.